Praise the Lord. That's good. Make it greater. I said praise the Lord. The Lord bless you. Lift you up. Quicken you. Make you remain alive and refreshed in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this session. Talking about your only begotten son, a savior, a lord, a redeemer, the ransom, and the one who has come to supply everything we need. We're asking, Lord, you bless your people. Everyone without exception. You bless us here and bless them there. Everywhere we are gathered together. I've been retreat, holding the retreat together. Bless everyone without exception in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, our lives will never be the same again. Thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. God has blessed you. You can see that we're coming to the inexhaustible, the irresistible, and the all-sufficient Jesus. We're coming this time to call to talk about his attribute, his quality, his power, and what he transmits to our lives. We're talking for this session on Jesus, the quickening redeemer. Savior and the transforming truth. He quickens us. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. And you as he quickened, who are dead in trespasses and sins. That's what quicken. It means make alive, make anew, transform, change, and turn around. You as you believe. You as you come to him, you as you rely on him, you as he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, it tells us, even when we were dead in sins, he has quickened us. Look at that word, quickened us together with Christ by grace. Are you saved? We're told in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. It says in Romans 8, 11, it says, But if the spirit of him that raised Jesus up from the dead dwell in you, it says he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body. But your mortal bodies by his spirits that dwelleth in you. Once again, we're talking about Jesus, the quickening redeemer, savior, and transforming truth. We're looking at uh, four things here now. Number one, we're looking at Jesus, the quickened, risen Christ, reviving our souls. Number two. We're looking at Jesus, the Redeemer, are now the Redeemer from the curse and the consequences of sin. Number three is Jesus as the Savior, is the sufficient Savior for all souls in every situation, every nation, and every generation. Number four, Jesus is the T. In the truth and he is sent from heaven to show the heavenly way. Look at number one. Number one, Jesus, the quickening or quickened, risen Christ, reviving our soul. In First Peter chapter 3, verse 18, it says, For Christ also, as one suffered for sins. The just for the unjust. We were unjust. We were unrighteous. Unqualified for heaven. And the qualified for the unqualified. The just for the unjust. That he 
might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the spirit. Three things we're looking at. Number one, as we're talking about our quickened redeemer and the quickening redeemer to number one, the quickening spirit for raising us to a supernatural stage. We come from a natural stage and because he comes to our lives and he quickens us and he revives us, he makes us to come to a supernatural state. Number two, the quickening Savior awakening us from sinfulness to solution and sonship. Number three, the quickening source of strength by the Spirit. Look at number one. Number one, we're talking about the quickening Spirit for raising us to a supernatural state. That's actually how Christ was referred to in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. God, the creator, breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. But the last Adam, referring to Jesus, referring to our Savior, referring to our Lord, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Made a quickening spirit. That's why when he comes into our lives, he actually quickens us or our dead. He quickens us. We are dull. He quickens us. We are dormant. He quickens us. It's like, you know, in life, sin deadened us. And sin makes us dumb, dormant. As if we could do nothing. And then Christ comes into our lives. And he quickens us. He will quicken you today. And then, look at what he does after that. Ephesians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 6. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, we're told now, he has raised us up together and made us to see together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. His quickening does not leave us where he found us, but now he quickened us, he raised us up, I are now seated with him in heavenly places. Look at number two. Number two here is the quickening Savior awakening us from sinfulness to salvation, to solution, and to sonship. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says, And you, as he quickened, who are dead, in trespasses and sins. Verse 5. In verse 5 it says. Even when we. All of us without exception. All have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. It says when. We were dead in sins. He has now quickened us together. With Christ. And it says by grace. Are you saved? Saved. Somebody there. Save my brother there. Save my sister there. Saved because Christ came and he quickened us. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, By grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Thank God I'm saved. Praise God, I am saved. It's yours in Jesus' name. Look at number three. Number three is the quickening source of strength by the Spirit. He said, it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, the Spirit, the Holy Ghost will not come. But if I go away, 
He died, he was buried, he rose, he appeared to his disciples with many infallible fruits for those 40 days, and then they saw him going to heaven. And when he went to heaven, he sent down the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, because now he is the Spirit that dwells with us, and he lives within us. He tells us in Romans chapter 8, Reading from verse 11, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Have you ever thought about that? The same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead so mighty and so powerful that that stone was rolled away. The same spirit the same power that raised up Jesus from the dead, that same spirit now dwells in my body. And inside you there, there's no room for Satan. Inside me, inside me, there's no room for Satan. Because the conqueror of death and sin and Satan now dwells in you. You accept that? Say amen. amen. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also, look at this, look at this, shall also quicken your mortal body. Whatever is putting that body down, dead, dormant, dumb, and cannot arise to do anything, that quickening power comes upon your body right now in Jesus' name. You're quickening your mortal body by a spirit that dwells in you. The spirit dwells in me. The spirit dwells in me. And all sicknesses, vanish. All dominating power vanish. You know, I, I get blessed when I saw that they just put the Ark of the Covenant in their temple. And Dagon, the chief of their idols, was there. And the Ark was there. No high priest was there. And no priest was there. By the time they woke up early the following morning, Dagon was falling down. They alive as Christ abides in you. And the spirit abides in you. Dagon will fall away from your life. Those people did not understand. Dumb, deaf, dead people. They are slow to understand. So they put their Dagon back again. They put their demon idol back again. And then the following day, the presence of the Ark of the Covenant in that place totally shattered and destroyed their Dagon, head off, arms off, feet off, and they never worship that Dagon anymore. That Dagon, whatever it is in your life, the Spirit of God enters into you. And every Dagon, every power, everything that Dagon has brought in your life, that shattered and destroyed, thrown away from your life in Jesus' name. We we'll come to point number two here now. Point number two, we're looking at Jesus, the Redeemer, that from the curse and the consequences of sin. You see, Christ, he is the redeemer. The redeemer from sin, yes. The redeemer from self, yes. The redeemer from sickness, yes. The redeemer from satanic oppression in your life, he has come to redeem you today. My brother there, you are redeemed. My son there, you are redeemed. Daughter there, you are redeemed in Jesus' name. And look at this in Galatians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 13. Christ has redeemed us. 
Not that he is going to do it. It's done already. It's yours for you to take. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Be made a curse for us. For it is written, cause said, is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Look at verse 14. He said that the blessing, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. It's mine. I said it's mine. Look at three things here. Number one. Number one. The ransom by sacrifice for all sinners. All sinners here. All sinners there. All sinners everywhere. Christ. Jesus has become the ransom by that sacrifice. Number two. The rock for sinners salvation. And for saints, the sufficiency for everyone. And both for those who do not believe, the scorners stumbling. He is the rock. Number three, the resurrection to supernatural spiritual life. Let's come to number one. Jesus is the ransom. The ransom by sacrifice. For all sinners. It tells us in Mark chapter 10 verse 45. Mark 10 verse 45. For even the son of man. Referring to Christ. Jesus came not to be ministered unto. But to minister and to give his life. A ransom for many. A ransom for many. You understand the language ransom? You're in captivity. You understand the ransom? You are there. You are bound there. And nothing you could look for by yourself except death. Painful death. As punishment for what you've done. And then Christ comes and he sees of the ransom. And he pays your ransom with his life. And now you're free from death. I was waiting for your amen. You're free from premature death. You're free from eternal death. Because he, Christ, paid the ransom for you. I am free. Look at number two here. Number two, we're talking about the rock. For the sinner's salvation, for the saint's sufficiency, for the scoffer's suffering. We're looking at stumbling. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'm reading from verse 4. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're looking at verse 4. It says, and they did all drink the same spiritual drink. And they all drank of that spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them. And that rock was Christ. And that rock was Christ. I see the children of Israel in the millions were going from Egypt, the land of bondage. They were going to Canaan, the land of blessing. On the way, they were thirsty. No water and no source of water. It was like going through a desert. And they cried unto the Lord. And Moses cried unto the Lord. And the Lord showed him a rock. A representation of Christ. And he said, strike the rock. And water will come out. He struck the rock. And water came out for the millions, for the children, for the boys, for the girls, for the men, for the women, the singles, the bachelors, and the fathers and the mothers, and everybody drank. And now the Spirit of God reminds us that that rock that followed them was Christ. Christ the rock. Everything you need today will flow out of that rock into your life. What our life? into your life 
and the water of satisfaction. Salvation, satisfaction, solution in your life today in Jesus' name. Because the rock has been smitten for it. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the resurrection to spiritual and supernatural life. In John chapter 11, Lazarus had died. And they had even buried him. And they put his stone off. Never wake up. We'll see you on the final eternal day. And so they put his stone there. And here Jesus comes. And Jesus comes to you now. My brother, my sister, I said, Jesus comes to you now. And everything dead in you will rise up. That dead brain will come up again. The dead life will be resurrected again in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Why? Because in John 11, verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though you are dead yet, he shall live. You believe, you will live. You live a better life here. The life that the cross of Christ has produced new life and then when you die eventually physically you'll be in the presence of the lord forever and ever in jesus name i will be there so if you get there look for me you will see me you will be there and when i get over there I'll be looking for that, my Taraba son, my Taraba daughter. You'll be there in Jesus' name because you believe on him who is the resurrection and the life. One of these days, there's something called the rapture that will happen. Already Enoch experienced that. Already Elijah experienced that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 14. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. In verse 15, it says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, precede them which are asleep. And then in verse 16, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first. You lost your amen. In verse 17, verse 17 says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together, that's the rapture, with them in the clouds, and it says to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we. And so shall I. And so will you ever be with the Lord. May it be confirmed in your life in Jesus' name. We'll come to point number three now. Point number three is that as Jesus, the Savior, sufficient for all souls, in every nation and in every generation, Jesus is sufficient for every soul, everywhere, in every generation, in every nation. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, we're told that we're told that um, the grace of God that bringeth salvation 
has appeared to all. In verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing is going to appear is the great God our Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 14, who gave himself for us, for you, for me, for all, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Can you say an amen there? You know, zeal is not something you can manufacture and cough up. Even if you try to do that, you will be zealous a day when you are happy, when you are excited, when you are cheerful. But then it will die down the following day. But when you meet Christ, it pulls a perpetual passion in your life. And it makes you so peculiar that you are zealous of just wanting to do good. Just loving to do good. That you are zealous of good works all the days of your life in Jesus' name. Three things we're looking at. We're looking at number one, the sacrifice was sweet smelling savor for our salvation and sanctification. Number two, the shepherd of the sheep with super abundant supply. Number three, is the shorty for our satisfaction and our steadfastness. Look at number one. Number one is a sacrifice with sweet smelling savor for our salvation and sanctification. Ephesians chapter 5. We're looking at verse 2. Ephesians chapter 5. Looking at verse 2 and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and he has given himself for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. To God, the sacrifice acceptable to God, appreciated by God, approved of God, just comes with sweet smelling savor unto Him. For what? For our salvation. For what? For our sanctification. Look at verse 25. Of that same chapter, husbands love your wives. There's nothing else to do. That's why you married her. Husbands love your wives. It's the most beautiful thing you can do in the family because it's the representation of what Christ has done for us. Husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 26, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself. A glorious church. What do you think the Lord is going to present to himself, to the Father, when we get on the other side? You know, when you're thinking of presenting something to an important personality, you look for this and look for that and choose something, I think you will appreciate this. I think you will know that this one really cost me something, and I'm presenting to him. And Jesus says, the church, the best. The church is the most glorious. The church is the greatest gift that can be presented to him to be presented to the Father. It says a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy. That's you. I say that's you. Satan says, you will not be holy. Jesus says, Satan, you are a liar. My son, my daughter, my follower, and the body of Christ will be holy. And, you know, your past life and your habit and what you're used to, he says, you cannot be holy. And Jesus shouts from heaven, that's a lie. You are going to be holy. I said, you are going to be holy. 
be holy and without blemish. Without blemish. Without blemish. That the sacrifice of Christ that makes us saved and makes us sanctified. Look at number two. Number two is talking about the shepherd of the sheep or supernatural supply. John chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 10. John chapter 10. Reading from verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. If that thief is referring to Satan, has visited you, which there, another visitation is coming. And everything the devil has to stolen out of your life, he who comes, our Savior, our Redeemer, he will restore everything stolen from your life in Jesus' name. Anything he has destroyed. Anything he has killed. Don't worry about that. After all, there's a Satan who is already judged and is on the feet. And now, the one who comes. Christ will bring abundance in your life. Say good amen. Let me illustrate. You lost one thing. And he who comes restores ten unto you. You lost something small when you didn't know him. But now you know him. And Christ, our shepherd, comes to restore more, much more than you lost in Jesus' name. He says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Anybody having life there? Eternal life there? Spiritual life there? Abundant life there? It's yours in Jesus' name. Don't look back and cry. Look forward and rejoice. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. We're looking at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the shorty for our satisfaction and steadfastness. Shorty. He is the shorty. It's the assurance. How do I know that the promises of God are surely to be fulfilled in my life because of the all-sufficient Jesus who is our shorty for satisfaction and for steadfastness. We're told in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22, for so much was Jesus made a surety. So much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, better life, better covenant, better provision, better personality from now on because Jesus the shorty is now in your life in my life in my life that the promises of heaven become sure for every one of us in Jesus name we're looking at number four now number four we're looking at Jesus the truth sent from heaven to show the heavenly way. Look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14. We're looking at it from verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. All trouble away from your heart in Jesus' name. You believe in God. Believe also in me, verse 2, in my father's house, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Don't worry where you are living now. It's going to prepare a place for you. 
Look at verse 3. In verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, where I am, where is Jesus now? Tell me. I say, where is Jesus now? You know, there are people that knock at your door. And as you open the door, they say, we'll come to tell you something. You need to hear this one. They say, what's that? They say, we are going to live here on earth forever. Who wants to live in Nigeria for a thousand years? For a hundred thousand years? For a million years? They say, that's the message they have for you. I say, I have a better message I got from heaven. Jesus said, where I am, there you will be also. I'll be there. I'll be there. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it says, Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is the way, the truth, the life. He is the way to life in truthfulness. We're looking at three things. Number one, number one, the teacher of the whole truth by the spirit number two he is the treasure that transforms sons to saints saints to servers number three he is the tower of safety and security shield the shield from all snares and storms look at number one number one Jesus is the teacher of the whole truth by the Spirit. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 16. In Matthew chapter 22, reading from verse 16, it says, And they sent out unto him their disciples. With the Herodians saying, Master, Lord, we know that thou art true. Well, whether they believed that to the depths of their hearts or not, that was the truth. You, you must understand. If you have a dead clock on the wall, that dead clock is right two times in the day. If it stops at five after six, dead, dead battery, dead activation, everything dead, yet at six or five in the morning, look at that dead uh, clock. It's right. It's correct. And then when you look at that dead clock in the evening, five after six, that dead clock is right. These people, they were dead. They were dead to spiritual things, but they have been observing. And once or twice in their lives, they're true. They're truthful. They're correct. And at this time now, they're correct. They say, we know that thou art true. And uh, is they said, thou teachest the way of God in truth. And it says, neither fearest thou any man, for thou regardest not the person of man. Well, that's absolutely true. Our Jesus, the one that teaches the whole truth, and he teaches by the courage of the Spirit. Look at number two here. Number two, we're looking at the treasure that transforms sons to saints and saints to servers. He'll transform your life. He will transform my life. When you give him the chance, it's the treasure 
that dwells in us and transforms us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, but we have this treasure in heaven vessels. We, we, with the believers, we who lean on Christ and we who trust in Christ and depend on him, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that is in the body of clay that the excellency of his power the reason he dwells in us is so that the excellency of his power be of God and not of us a power beyond your own natural power when Christ enters in that treasure will bring the power in your life in Jesus' name. From a sinner, you'll be transformed to a son. From a son, you'll be transformed to a saint. From a saint, you'll be transformed to a server. You will serve the Lord. I said you will serve the Lord. And your service will be acceptable to the Lord. In Jesus' name. We're looking at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the tower of safety and security. The shield from all snares and storms of life. Every snare, the Lord will shield you. Every storm, the Lord will shield you. Everything that comes to make you suffer unbearably the Lord will shield you in Jesus name is a tower the tower for your safety the tower for your security look at Proverbs chapter 18 verse 10 it says the name of the Lord is a strong tower the name of the Lord is a strong tower thank God we have a tower of refuge. If Satan is chasing anybody, enter into the refuge and into the security of that tower. Satan will not catch you. Run under the blood of the Lamb. Under the blood of the Lamb, Satan's hand is not long enough to reach you there. And come under the powerful word of the Lord. And under that powerful word of the Lord, you're under the control, under the tower of the word. Satan has no right. He has no power to go beyond himself and reach you there. You're shielded from snares, from storms, in Jesus' name. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, a mighty tower, an impenetrable tower. The righteous runneth into it, and he is saved. I come to announce to you today that you are saved. You are protected. You are preserved. And the security in the name will never fail in your life in Jesus' name. We've we'll learned more about Christ. And all we need to do now is to do what the scripture has said. You run into him. You run into the city. You run into the tower. And everything you need for life, for godliness, for earth, for heaven, for getting to heaven, the Lord grant unto every one of you. Are you there? I said the Lord grant to every one of you. Amen. Why don't you rise up and say, Lord, I come. Lord, I come. It's mine. It's mine. As I see Jesus more and more. Know Jesus more and more. And now I can run into him. And everything I need is made available for me. Open your mouth and pray unto the Lord.